Today, we are very fortunate to have Stephanie Songson Benton here. She just recently relocated to um, Utah from DC and New York City. Is it fair to say both of those for you? Um, she got to commute a bit to DC from New York. So um, Stephanie just finished a stint working with Mia Love as her finance director for the campaign. And I think that's quite relevant and quite interesting and maybe a little bit gossipy for us to enjoy some of those tidbits. And then before that, as I said, she worked on Capitol Hill and for five years. And in the five years she was there, she worked as a press secretary, a deputy press secretary, and a new media manager in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, she's also interned for Edelman Public Re Relations World Worldwide and Logo Works by HP. She is a graduate of Brigham Young University, and we're very excited to have her here today. Thank you, Stephanie. So, oh, oh, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Kelly, um, for that nice introduction. So, Kelly and I were emailing a couple weeks ago about the campaign, or about speaking, and I was talking about how it'd be just right after the campaign, and she said, oh, you'll probably still have that campaign afterglow, and it's more like an after gloom now, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I'm very honored to be here and share a little bit about my experiences and Hopefully um, some of the things I say can be helpful to you guys um, as you're pursuing your careers. Um, today I'm going to briefly outline my career path and describe what my various jobs have entailed, share a couple of highs and low points, um, as well as answer a couple of frequently asked questions that I get, and leave you with some words of advice. So I must preface my lecture by saying that, uh, which might lose me all credibility in this room, and that is that I've never taken a political science class. Um, the closest that I came was American Heritage, and I took a British history class from Jeff Ringer when I did a study abroad in London, but I was a communications major. I studied public relations, but um, in this career, I have found that I've been able to really um, kind of mesh my, what I feel like I'm good at, which is communications, with my passion for American history and government and politics. So, oh, we're gonna, is this right? Oh, whoops, okay, here we go, my career path. Okay, so this is just a brief summary of kind of um, what I did and since I graduated. So if you look at my career path strictly on how I went, it might look like I actually took a continual demotion because I went from the Senate to the House to a campaign. And most people don't really go that route, um, but it worked for me. So everything that I say should be just taken um, and know that you know everybody has different paths and different things work for different people. Um, so my dad actually did the Washington Seminar Program in the 70s and before he started a career in finance. So I thought I should do this to get you know some good experience before I start my um, my career in communication. So I interned for my congressman. I'm from Ohio originally. So um, for Congressman Pat T. Berry from Ohio. Oh, the pointer. Um, oh, was it up? Oh, there we go. There we go. So Congressman T. Berry. And um, that was enough to wet my palate, and I just loved it. I loved D.C. I wanted to go back. So I... Um, I did after, that was between my junior and senior year. So then I went back and I got a job as the deputy press secretary for Senator Voinovich, also from Ohio. I was with him for three years until he um, decided to retire from political life. And so then I moved over to the House side, worked for a guy named Ken Calvert from California and was his new media manager. I also handled a legislative portfolio. I did that for a year. And then I was with Steve Austria, who's from Ohio and I was his press secretary for a year. And then, as she said, this summer I moved back to Utah and started working as um, Mia's finance director. So I did all of her fundraising for the last four months. Okay, next. I think this is pretty funny. Um, my husband didn't get it, but hopefully political science people will get it. And this is funny, of course, because a lot of interns go to DC thinking that they're gonna be doing really important things when really they're answering phones and opening mail at best. Um, but I actually do wanna make the case for why I think it's really important that people have an experience on the Hill. So if you think about it, if you go to DC or anywhere, the only federal government office buildings that are open to the public are Congress, the legislative branch. And this is because the legislative branch and its very structure tries to make it open and available for the people that it serves. And this is because 
that's what they're there for. They're there to serve their constituents. So you can't just walk into a judge's office. You can't walk into the president's office. You can't even walk in and talk to an employee at the Department of Education. You'll get to the lobby at best. But you can walk into any of the congressmen's offices. Um, so we elect a president every four years and give them that time to kind of promote their agenda and put forth the agenda that they, they got elected on or whatever. Um, but Congress is beholden to its constituents every single day through every single vote that they take. So, and that is significant. Every office has an open door policy. You can walk into any office on the Hill and talk to their staffers. And uh, you will walk down the hall and see some of the most important people making the most important decisions um, for our country. And I was in the bathroom once when I was at work and, and I heard, overheard these women and they're like, oh, they must have seen at the security, they must have seen my military badge because they let me, they didn't even ask me any questions. I'm like, no, they don't ask any questions. As long as you're not carrying a gun, you can get into that building. There used to be home, if you talk to anybody who's worked there for a really long time, there used to be homeless people that actually lived in the basements of these buildings. Um, they've cleaned that up a little bit, but um, if you call your representative about a problem that you're having with your dishwasher, I guarantee they'll try in some capacity to help you. They'll probably like, push you off to the Better Business Bureau or something. But they're not just going to hang up on you because they work for you. And this is kind of why I wanted to work in politics because I really liked kind of the idealistic side of it. Um, but as an intern, you're immersed in this culture and you can't help but see these people and get all this. And as an intern, you get access to most of the Capitol building. You can walk around the basements, you can walk around the rotunda. If you have your intern badge, they're not gonna question you. And so just being in that environment will set you up for a lifetime of understanding your role as a citizen in this country. Um, and it will change your perspective, even if you're there for a month. Um, it'll change your perspective. It's a worthwhile endeavor just to just to be there in that environment. Um, so I saw my job as being able to, I wasn't just working for the government. When people talked to me about that, I'd say, no, I work for the constituents of Ohio. And my job was communicating what their congressman or their representative was doing for them and promoting their values and trying to give the information to the public about what their representatives are doing for them. And that was a very fulfilling job for me um, to do. So. I worked in the Senate, like I said, for three years. Um, I worked with reporters. I drafted press releases, quotes for the senator, and then we'd go over them. Um, I prepped him for interviews. I wore, wrote a weekly column for him that we sent out to all of our smaller newspapers um, in the state. I frequently escorted him to the Capitol to vote if we knew there would be a lot of press there, trying to ask him questions to kind of help him um, get in and out of meetings. Um, one of the fun, the most fun things that happened when we were there is um, that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield sponsored this thing that they called a walking challenge, and they gave all these Hill staffers pedometers, and it was a six-week challenge where you had to see who could walk the most. It was to promote healthiness, um, and the New York Times actually came and did a story on it, and I was, you can see my quote right there in um, in red. So that was my. 30 seconds of fame, um, if you will. So that was really fun. And so, um, and we actually, um, so there, there's me, here, I'll use the pointer, there's me. And um, we're showing off our pedometers. And then I'm actually walking behind the senator, you can't really see me. And that's uh, who I worked for, Senator Voinovich, right outside the Capitol building. And then I don't know why he made it in here, but, because he's not really walking, but that's uh, Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr. So um, that, was, that was kind of a fun little thing that we did, um, that we got some, some exposure on, and actually we were in first place the entire time, and then at the last minute, um, Senator Stevens' office ended up winning. They must have walked from Alaska that week because they certainly made up some some time. Um, and and I, I won't call it karma, but he was shortly thereafter indicted and <laughs> then lost his bid for the Senate. And they were they actually lit, their office was right, right across the hall from us, and they gave us their trophy that they had stolen from us and let us have it for the rest of the year, which was very nice of them. Um, okay, and so then I moved over to the House side. Um, so Congressman Calvert's office was looking for to replace a legislative assistant, but they wanted somebody with communications experience. And I said, I've never done a legislative portfolio. And they said, you can handle it. You've worked on the Hill. You get it. 
which may or may not be true. But it was really fun, and that's probably, if you're in political science, more of what you're interested in doing. Um, being a legislative assistant is very research heavy. You're always researching bills to see if your boss wants to either sponsor them or co-sponsor them, vote for them or against them. And you're always working with colleagues in other offices to draft legislation and promote the agenda and priorities of your boss. And then, of course, you're also working with constituents to let them know why your boss voted on um, a bill a certain way. Um, I remember I got a letter from a lady who was really upset that you couldn't, um, I handled postal issues, and she was very upset that you couldn't mail tarantulas. It's they're like dangerous species. There's like a rule actually against it. So I had to research all this stuff about why this was a policy and then draft this letter to her responding to her why the US Postal Service, and I even emailed them and I got like an official response back that I used in my letter. So you, you know, it covers quite a range of, of things that you can do. So um, I did that, that was really fun. And then I also handled his social media. So like his Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, and after a year of that, I actually really missed working for my home state um, and working for Ohio. So an opportunity came up and I moved over to be the press secretary for um, Steve Austria, who's from Ohio. And this was a great opportunity for me to reconnect with many of the reporters I'd worked with in Senator Voinovich's office and also gave me the opportunity to run a press operation that was a little bit smaller, but um, I was a one-person one shop. Um, so I worked really closely with the congressman, um, our chief of staff, and our legislative director to craft our press message based on what the congressman was doing legislatively. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to share was, this is really embarrassing, but there's this newspaper that covers Congress called The Hill, and every year they do this really dumb thing, but they pick out the uh, the 50 most beautiful people on the Hill, and I was actually featured in that. Um, so I figured if you guys were falling asleep, you may wake up for this. So it's really stupid. They called, they nicknamed me Freckles. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's a lot more to life on the Hill than just policy, obviously. And then I have to say that you have to take this uh, with a grain of salt because these people also won. So there you go. <laughs> it's very loose, loose category. Okay. So then, um, so I often, because I worked in the House and the Senate, I often get questions from people. What is the difference? Um, so both qualify as Hill experience, and they're very different and and the same at the same time. And they're very similar at the same time. Um, so. Senate offices are bigger. They have anywhere from 30 to 40 people in D.C. and then about the same amount throughout the state that they represent. House offices have between 8 and 12 people um, in, in D.C. and then about the same um, throughout the state. So um, there's, there's a, when you're in a House office, you can handle a broader range of issues, but then you also get not as much exposure as, as a Senate office. But I actually recommend that most people start on the House side um, because it's easier to move up quickly and people switch jobs more frequently um, and you get more face time with your boss and, um, and people can do, you, you kind of get more responsibilities at a younger age. Um, so when I worked in the Senate, I saw people that worked as a staff assistant answering phones for one, two, even three years before becoming a legislative correspondent, which is underneath a legislative assistant, and you're basically writing letters the entire time. So, um, but, you know, every situation is different. Like I said, my situation was different because I went into the press office, and so in a press sense, I was able to um, get a lot more responsibilities because there were only three of us in our press office. And I worked with the senator um, almost every day. And I, I'd probably say that at my kind of pay grade and, and where I came in, my level, I was the one that had the most um, interactions with the senator. A lot of my friends who were the same age who were doing the legislative stuff, um, he didn't even know who their, what their names were and they never had meetings with him. There were people that, there's just a higher chain of command. But um, that having been said, you know, um, there's a lot more members in the House and a lot more kind of yahoos. I mean, you saw Jesse Jackson on a scooter. Um, so the Senate is definitely more prestigious, and like I said, so it's often based on opportunity that you can find, and that really varies from office to office. Okay. Oh, okay, so being on the Hill also means having a front row seat to some of the scandals that occur where politicians implode. And especially as a press person, it's really exciting to watch how they handle their downfalls. Um, so these are some of the scandals that occurred while I worked on the Hill. And I want you guys to see if you can guess who these people are and what their alleged crimes were. So who knows who that is? 
and obviously he was indicted. Come on, maybe you guys are just too young. 2007 to 2012, you guys were probably like in high school. Um, so that's Ted Stevens, Senator Stevens, who I mentioned um, from Alaska, and he was indicted for lots of corruption things, and he ended up um, losing his Senate bid. He was the longest serving member of the Senate at the time, um, and he also actually died in a plane crash a couple years ago. Okay, next. You guys know who that is. Barney Frank, yeah, and he uh, had ethics charges thrown at him. Who's that? Yeah, Patrick Kennedy, Congressman Kennedy. He, do you remember what he did? He uh, got st stopped on Capitol Hill for drunk driving, and then he, I don't know, he like has, he was in a, men he like had mental problems. He like said he was having, I don't know, depression or something. That's, that's why he was drinking. Does anybody know who that is? That's um, Maxine Waters, Congresswoman. She also had ethics charges thrown against her. Does anybody know who this guy is? It's a good story. Um, this is uh, Congressman Vito Fasanelli um, from New York. He's a Republican. And he got stopped in Alexandria, Virginia for drunk driving and ended up telling the cop, oh, I've got to go get pick up my son. Nobody knew he had another family in Virginia, so he got in big trouble. <laughs> um, and of course, this guy, David Vitter, congressman from Louisiana, they did a, they busted a prostitution ring in D.C. and found his phone number in it. <laughs> and everybody knows this one. Who's this? Anthony Weiner, Congressman Weiner, with his Twitter downfall. That's the picture that that led to his one of the pictures that he s tweeted this girl. And then my personal favorite, because I actually worked um, right across the hall. I had like sat in an internal window on an atrium, and on the other side of the hall was this guy's office. So I literally had a front row seat too when this was going down, but this is, of course, Senator Craig with his bathroom incident in Minnesota. So you guys might be too young to remember that one, but that was, that was a wild ride. He resigned, said he was guilty, and then didn't, and then he said he was, was going to resign, and then he just never left. Um, Okay, so that's always fun. Okay, and then when the scandal hits home, so you always watch with great interest when the scandal is happening to someone else, but there were a few times I had to deal with them myself as a press person. And so I'd actually say they weren't so much scandals as putting out fires. Um, so one that I had was, it was my first month on the job with Senator Voinovich, and he um, went on the Sean Hannity radio station. And um, he was actually working on this, um, he was the first Republican that came out and said, hey, we need, a, we need to figure out a way out of, out of Iraq. And uh, this was in 2007. And so he was getting a lot of press about that, and he was really focused on that, and he'd just written this paper about it. And then at the same time, the Senate was voting on this immigration bill. And so we went on the Sean Hannity show um, to talk about this immigration bill. But the problem was, and I, I was so new that they let me sit in the room for this interview, which I thought would be so great, and it turned out to be so terrible. Um, but I, I wasn't, I'm not trying to push off lane, but I wasn't in charge of prepping him for this interview. Um, but the, my boss, who was supposed to, I really thought he would get fired over this, but he did not prep him for this interview. And that's, that's the problem here, is that he was not, in his memo, I read the memo, and it was like, make sure you speak into the phone clearly. You know, it wasn't substantial. And so um, Sean Hannity was asking him real questions, and he just didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what the bill was, and he ended up getting really defensive and ended up saying, <laughs> I've been in this business 40 years. Nobody intimidates George Voinovich. It's like, what? he's the nicest man. I don't know why you would say that. He was throwing papers in the office. I had been there a month. I was scared out of my mind. And he ends up hanging up on Sean Hannity. It was terrible. Um, and so I don't know if we really handled it. It was just so much pretended that, that it didn't happen. And he wasn't running again. So, um, But if he had decided to run again, that would have absolutely come up, I'm sure, because he just sounded totally crazy. And the problem was he just wasn't briefed properly for this. And that, that goes into legislative things when, you, um, you know, when your boss goes to a hearing or something. They give opening remarks. They ask questions. If they're not briefed, um, 
that you're going to end up making them look like an idiot. And, and um, the egg is on their face, but really it's, it's your responsibility as a staffer to make sure that they have the information and that you've sat down with them and gone over it with them and answered any questions that they have. So really, you need to be the expert for your boss. And, and you can't be the expert at everything. So that means you have to go find the people that can help you. And whether that means talking to other offices or the member who sponsored the bill or talking to businesses in your area and asking them how this is going to affect them. Um, there's a lot of different ways of going about educating yourself on these things. Um, and then the other one that I handled was um, when I worked for Congressman Austria. Um, I also wrote this, this um, bi-weekly column um, or bi-monthly bi column that we would send out to our smaller papers and they would print it like it was, you know, kind of this column from their congressman um, and they'd print it in these smaller newspapers. It was a good way of connecting with our constituents. Um, but so we, I was doing one about Memorial Day and I, we actually, one thing on the Hill is you often reuse a lot of the same information, a lot of the same quotes, a lot of the same things. So I was kind of going through our archives and seeing what we'd written about Memorial Day before. And I found this great speech, and it was fantastically written, and it was from when he was in the State House um, before he came to Congress. And I, so it was so well written, and my instincts should have told me that it, that it was too good to be true. But I asked him, I said, did you give this speech in the state house. He said, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I gave it on the floor. And my speechwriter at the time wrote it for me. So I didn't use all of it, but I pulled out some bits and pieces of it and sent it out. And um, two days later, a blogger from a left-wing blog found out that it had been plagiarized. And um, this, that's just like, you don't, you're not supposed to do that. You know, obviously, you guys know, you're in college. So, um, and it, it, it turned out that it was plagiarized. And I'd even, I just, and I even, and I guess his speechwriter in the state house had plagiarized it, and he'd actually given the speech on the floor of the state house about ten years prior, a completely plagiarized speech. And um, so this, you know, this is on a left wing blog. They're always trying to attack us, you know. So we're just like, well, as long as none of our, this is not for an Ohio blog, as long as nobody in Ohio finds out about this, you know. And the next day, I get a call from our biggest newspaper, saying, "What's up with this?" You know, and. You never lie, you never lie. You can withhold information, but you never lie. So I ex <laughs> explained it to him. And the, the interesting thing was, I had worked as a reporter when I worked in Senator Voinovich's office, and we had established a very good relationship. And, and I had helped him out, and he'd helped me out. And so when I explained the situation to him, and how it was, n it was not the congressman's fault, and it really wasn't a staff, it was my error, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't, trying to plagiarize, and, and it was from a staffer from a long time ago. He said, I don't see a problem with this, and he never did anything with it. So really, that shows how this relationship that I had established with this reporter really saved, saved us in the end, um, and, and it never became a problem. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about probably what everybody wants to hear about, fundraising for Mia Love. Um, so it is a very small world, especially in the BYU or the LDS community. So I, we moved here in Utah for my husband's job. I had no um, idea what I was going to do when I got here. But the day after we got here, I just emailed the campaign manager. He's a friend of a friend and asked if he'd like to grab lunch. So I'd love to hear more about the Me Love campaign. And he responded and asked if I'd like to apply as, for a job as a finance director. And truthfully, I had to Google finance director because I had no, I'd never worked on a campaign. I had no idea what that meant. So I found out that it meant fundraising, and I thought, well, I guess I could do that. And luckily, it has parlayed very well from communications. Um, and actually, they told me that the reason why I got the job was the interview had gone well. And but as I was walking out the door, I turned to them and I gave them three suggestions for fundraising. Fundraising, one suggestion, and two people that I thought they should try and reach out to in the business community. And um, I really had genuinely been thinking about this, and um, but they said, you know, that's how we knew that you were right for this job because your mindset was in the right place. Um, so people often have asked me if it's hard to ask people for money, and I always tell them that it's a lot easier working than working with reporters. And um, donors are always on your side. Um, whether they give you money or not, they like you, they support you, and they're not going to say anything bad about you. That is not true for reporters. Okay, so... Um, we're going to see if you guys can guess. We'll just shout out some numbers here. So, Mia Love spoke at the Republican National Convention in Tampa, really raised her national profile. How much money do you think we raised within four days, online only, after her speech? Yeah. $200,000. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and how much do you think we raised in four months, the last four months? Total. Anybody know? Okay. What? Did you hear how much money was poured into this race? The Jim Matheson Me Love race? So I put it all on one slide, so that's why I'm not answering your questions. Oh, and we also had some great people come in and visit and support me. So we had Speaker of the House John Boehner come twice. We had Condoleezza Rice. Um, Chairman Ryan came, that's him and his wife, and actually Mia's husband right there. Um, he came before he was tapped as VP, presidential. Not, um, oh, and then we had Senator McCain come and do a town hall for her. Okay, so within four days of her speech, online only, we raised $250,000. And we raised 1.5 million in the four months I was there. And $10 million was invested in the Matheson Love race. And it's the most money ever raised in a congressional race in Utah. And this was my first job in fundraising. And I think I'm going to retire now because I'll never raise that much money for a congressional race again. Um, OK. So people often ask me this question now, too. Um, the difference between campaigns and working on the Hill. So the wonderful thing is that my experiences are always changing and tweaking my opinions. So if you asked me four months ago if I would ever worked on it, if I would have ever worked on a campaign, I would have said no because people in camp on campaigns work on campaigns to get the job that I already had on the Hill, which is true because a lot of people do that to get on the Hill, and it's actually a really great way to get a job on the Hill instead of just moving out to D.C. with no prospects. You really you're going out there knowing that you have a job because you worked on the campaign. Um, and I used to believe there's a certain personality type um, for working on the Hill and a certain personality for campaigns. And I don't necessarily believe that anymore because I really enjoyed both. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised to find that there's more substance and thought um, behi and behind the strategy on a campaign than I had presumed. I thought it was all um, menial tasks and yard signs and really just grassroots. But really, there's, there's a lot of policy, a lot of strategy, a lot of um, room for out-of-the-box thinking. Sometimes on the Hill, there's so much bureaucracy and red tape that you really get kind of, um, you know, you come in with all these ideas and they're like, no, no, let me tell you how it really is. But you go into a campaign and you can really implement a lot of the ideas that you have. Um, so there's still a lot of rules in fundraising, but it's faster paced and a little bit more opportunity to be creative in some ways. Um, so I really liked my campaign experience. Um, but, you know, you usually don't get paid a lot, but you guys aren't getting paid right now at all, going to school probably. So... Um, I would suggest doing a campaign first. It's really hard to go from a salary to nothing. So working on a campaign is a good experience. You just have to do it when you're kind of young in your career. Um, so here's some of my favorite articles and headlines that um, from Mia. So Politico had this article that was titled Flush with Cash. As a fundraiser, it just can't get better than that because people don't actually, donors don't look at that and think, oh, she doesn't, have, she doesn't need any more money. They look at that and think, I want to get on this. I want to jump on this bandwagon. And then here, she was also um, featured as one of the 25 women to watch The Hill. They like doing those kinds of lists. OK, so the power of networking. So here's a personal statistic. Every job I have ever gotten has been because of somebody I've known. And this is kind of what, you, you when you think of networking, that's sometimes what it looks like. So. Networking is very, very normal in D.C. It's the norm. Um, so even though I left my job in D.C. I'd, and had no prospects in Utah, I really had been laying the groundwork for years. Um, I knew all of, a lot of the staffers in the different Utah offices. Um, and so within an hour of interviewing for me, I had two people call me and tell me they heard I was interviewing. I didn't tell anybody except my husband. Um, and then... They never asked me for a single reference, but talked to four people about me, which is pretty crazy to me that, um, that the, the little like political science on the Hill, post on the Hill, Utah scene can be so small. Um, so sometimes networking has a bad connotation, but it should really be seen as something 
it's not something artificial. You don't put on your networking suit or your networking hat. Um, it's, it's, in DC, it's really not abnormal to just email somebody out of the blue and ask them to grab lunch. And people actually love to talk about, they love to mentor, especially if you're just new. I just email tons of people and just say, hey, can we grab lunch? It's great to hear people's experiences. Um, and they're going to be honored and delighted. And if they don't have time, they just won't respond. And they're not annoyed. They just don't have time. Um, so actually, when I interned for my congressman, he was like, who's your congressman when you go to school at BYU? And I was like, Congressman Chris Cannon at the time. And he was friends with Chris. So he was like, I want you to meet him. So he set up an appointment for me to meet with Chris in his office in DC. So I went over to his office. And I was there for like 30 minutes. And we just talked about his job. And he was like showing me all the stuff he did for his committee. He got on his computer. He was like showing me. And I was just asking him questions. And it was great. It was like, I just got a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one with a congressman, you know? And so then like the next day, my congressman was like, oh, I heard that you had a great meeting with, with Chris. He said that you were so smart and you're awesome. And he's so, he thinks you have a bright future ahead of you. And the funny thing was, I hardly said two words. I just let him talk the whole time. Like I just let, I just asked him questions and he just loved talking and he was super nice. But really that's all it takes is, is just, being interested and hearing about their experiences and, and see how they can help you in the future. Um, so these kind of worlds of power and, and influence on the Hill, they're really more accessible than you realize. And if you are smart and you work hard and you're thoughtful about your decisions, um, you can get far because these aren't impenetrable walls or inroads. You just have to find um, the right way of going about it. So how strong is your network? That's something I really wanted to stress to you guys today. So if you haven't done so yet, I encourage you guys to create and keep up a LinkedIn profile. And LinkedIn actually has some pretty powerful tools to help you take advantage and take inventory of your network. So here's a great example of LinkedIn maps that I mapped out my network. So it color codes based on correlation, correlations and connections with each other. So we'll use a little pointer. So here I am right here in the middle. Over here, this like, this fuchsia color, these are my connections from Senator Voinovich's office. Down here, this darker red, that's um, Congressman Austria. Right here in this blue are people that I knew from my Edelman internship in DC before I started on the Hill. Um, yellow is people in DC that weren't related to my job. I just met randomly. Up here, this green, this is my LDS New York network. And then here, this orange is my BYU network. And then down here, this mass of blue, that is my DC LDS network. Um, so as you can see, right over here is my Mormon network, you could say. And this is my DC, or non-Mormon. And then gray is like random like relatives and stuff that have no connections to those other people. <laughs> um, so as you can see, my most valuable network continues to be the LDS community. Um, let's see. Okay. So now some of my expert advice, which you can take or leave. So make yourself valuable now. When I was a press secretary, we had this kid come in who was also in a press shop on the Hill do a demonstration about social media that he'd done for his congressman. And he started out as an intern in that office, and he totally revamped this guy's social media. They had to hire him because he did all this stuff that they didn't know how to do, and they didn't know how to recreate it, and they liked it. So he literally created a position for himself. Um, technology is one area that you, are, you could come into an office and know more about than everybody in that office. There are not many skills that you can know more about the people that you're working with than they, than they do, first day on the job. Technology is one of those areas. I really, and I'm probably aging myself by even calling it technology, but so, I would recommend taking some classes to help you get proficient in these things. I would take an Excel class. Knowing Excel shortcuts are gonna help you in any job that you have and make you look really smart around the office. People will come to you for help. Um, so I would recommend really trying to find those classes that can help you beef up um, your skills. You know, when it, uh, that resume part where it says skills, where you can say, I know this technology, I know this program. Um, that is something really valuable that I've seen people come in and, um, and do really well if they have those skills. So get to know your congressman. When you go home for, for uh, Christmas this year, stop by his office 
and just introduce yourself. Say you're a political science uh, major. Say you could be interested someday. Ask them about their internship program. Just introduce yourself. It'll be valuable to lay that groundwork. And if it's here in Utah, go meet those members. Go to some of their town halls and, um, it's, and follow what they're doing. Follow them on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter. Hear what they're talking about. Just joining that conversation. Um, if you already know those things, they're going to be really impressed if, they are, if you already know these things about them or you take the opportunity to try and, and reach out to them. I have to plug Washington Seminar because I did it and I loved it. It's a great opportunity. Um, it's the cheapest housing you'll ever find in DC. Um, and they really have done a, a ma fantastic job. I saw a lot of interns come in and I think Washington Seminar is the best program that I've seen. Um, and I've, se I've seen a lot. Attend Beyond BYU in May. I have to put in a plug for that, too. Um, that's this annual event that they've done now three years. That'll be the fourth year in May, um, where it's really becoming the weekend. If you're interested in going to DC and you have a weekend or you want to fly out there and see what it's like, go that weekend. They have a wonderful networking opportunity where you can meet some of the best people. And there's so many people in the BYU and the LDS community in DC that want to help mentor kids um, and students. Okay, my next piece of advice is start on the hill. Um, everybody that I met in DC, if they didn't start on the hill, they wish they would have. It's a great place to just start. It's really hard to jump into that. It's a lot easier to work your way up. Um, I, I saw people coming out of law school that had never worked on the hill that wanted to get a law job on the hill. It's, it's almost impossible because it's all about who you know. So if you've laid that groundwork, if you then go to law school in five years, you can come back and say, well, I. It, it it seems weird that two months of working on the hill somehow qualifies you more than other people, but it, it does. Um, write handwritten notes. So I just printed these off. I have these thank you notes just with my monogram with, with my name on them. They're super cheap. I got them on Vistaprint. This isn't necessarily for when you interview for jobs, because a lot of jobs that I've interviewed for, the process has gone so fast that I've just sent thank you emails. But this is anytime you meet with somebody for lunch or anything, just send them a send them a handwritten note. They're not going out of style. They'll always be classy. Um, people really appreciate that, and they remember those types of things. Um, don't be a flake. Um, so you know, if you say you're going to do something, do it. I had a girl ask me to recommend her for a job, and I did. And then I find out later she never even ended up applying. I'm like, I'm never going to never going to recommend you again, you know? So if you tell people, if you make appointments, make sure you always keep those. Um, and because it's a very small world, reputations can get broken really quickly too. And then nobody cares about your sorority. So I worked in DC. I know there's no sororities here, so it's kind of funny. But I had a lot of interns when I worked on the Hill. And I had so many girls that would tell me all about their sororities. And I just did not care. And I actually think it made them look stupider. So just know that what you say represents your world and, and recognize that other people weren't raised the same way. So people make assumptions about who you are based on what you talk about. So just check yourself and know that, you know, recognize what you're bringing to the table, recognize what they're bringing to the table, and just make sure you understand um, how are they hearing what I'm saying? So, you know, if, if you're talking all about something and they're not responding, just, just you know, there's, it's kind of just, it's a maturity thing and also just um, a self-awareness thing. But most importantly, find your passions and pursue them. So I can boil politics down into two terms, power and passion. My advice is don't go after the power, but go after your passion and let your passions guide you. Don't worry about the power. And then why it matters. So when I interned uh, for, when I was in the Washington Seminar Program, the, I stayed at the Barlow Center, which is really close to down, it's in downtown, it's right by GW, and you walk to the metro, it's like a five minute walk, um, right by the GW Hospital, and then you get on the metro and go to the hill. And there's lots of homeless people in DC, but there was this one guy that always stuck out to me, and he was this, um, he didn't seem that old, African-American guy, and he'd always be sitting there every morning when I passed him, and he was always just sitting there holding a sign, and he kind of had this, like, 
it wasn't it was like a glaze over look, not in like a drug way, but just in like a hopelessness sort of way. And he wouldn't make eye contact with you. And he just sat there and held this sign that said, and it said, homeless, please help. God bless you. And I passed him every day. And uh, for some reason, he just stuck out to me. I saw a lot of homeless people, but he always, I just always felt so sad for him. And then when I was coming to my end of my time there, I saw him one day. I realized that I had been reading the sign wrong the entire time and that the sign actually said, homeless, please help, God bless you. And it made me realize that he was absolutely right, that um, there were, have been so many people in my life that have given me the opportunities I have had to pursue my dreams and to pursue things and that I have been greatly blessed and that with great responsibility or with great blessings comes a great responsibility. So um, I would just leave that with you guys that um, if you're sitting in this room, it probably means that you've had parents or friends or bishops or mission presidents that have helped you and guide you and helped you get to this place where you have all the opportunities in the world ahead of you. And I would just um, urge you to remember that what you've been blessed with and to, to um, use that in the world for good. And, um, you know, whether that means in your profession or in your extracurricular or in your family, just find a way to help the people around you. Um, one of the, you know, people always ask me, what's the highlight of your career? And honestly, I can say that I think it was when I was working in a congressional office and this guy came in and he was like a biker. He like had biker clothes on. He was like scary. And I've been sitting at the front desk. He's like coming towards me. He's like, are you Stephanie? And I'm like, yes. And he hands me an orchid, like a flower. And he says, this is for you. You helped me get my medical disability insurance. And, and I it had just done my job. You know, I'd helped him with this casework thing. And he said, without you, I wouldn't have gotten my medical disability. And thank you so much. It has changed my life. And really, it's finding the one person that you can help. And that's what my career has, has really boiled down to, is helping constituents. I know it's idealistic. I know that sometimes people can get jaded by it, but it's real. You're helping people, you're helping your constituents, and you're helping this country um, and this cause. And I leave those things with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And before I take questions, I actually have extra credit. So I have an assignment for you guys, and this is to help you um, the test how strong your network is. So the assignment is called Finding Garrett. And my husband's passing out sheets right now. And there's money on the line. So the, there will be one winner. And they will get a $30, like a Visa gift certificate that they can use for anything. But I would recommend that you use it to buy yourself some monogram stationery. So <laughs> this is Garrett. She was my first boss when I worked for Congressman Voinovich. She now is a communications director for Senator Moran. And my husband had this assignment when he went to Columbia Business School, so I know it's a legit assignment. So what you have to do is you are allowed to send one email to one person that you know, and you're trying to find somebody who can find somebody that knows this girl, Garrett. So Garrett has to receive a personal email from somebody that she knows that somehow down the chain came from you. So, but you can only reach out to one person. You can do research on Facebook or LinkedIn, and you can look up her profile. You could even find her personal email, but you can't, she won't respond to you unless she knows you. So you have to find somebody that will know her, or somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that so knows somebody that will know her. And you'll have a week to do it, and in a week I'll determine who, and Garrett will tell me who's emailed her, and whoever got to her with the least amount of links will win and I'll send you a $30 gift certificate in the mail. So that's it. And I have this, and you can use this template if you want to, um, to send it out to people. And just make sure you keep this disclaimer on the bottom. So um, does that make sense? Let me know if you guys have any questions about that. Um, but it really is just to test how strong and far reaching your own network is. And it's pretty incredible when you see how far reaching it is. OK, that's all. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good. Thanks for uh, all you're doing. Thanks, Thanks. for coming out. No uh, problem. Um, uh, my name is AJ. I'm actually a, a journalism major. Nice. But uh, I had a quick question about the love, Matheson race. Yeah. Um, so 
Obviously, it was a little longer what than happened, an, right? a little longer yes. than I anticipated. <laughs> Just kind of a follow-up question. Some of the critiques of the love campaign that I read, at least in the fallout since she was officially conceded, was basically she should have spent less time talking to Wolf Blitzer and more time talking to Doug Fabrizio, basically making the point that she got caught up in the national scene and lost her roots. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that critique? And do you think... Uh, does that sour the taste that she didn't come out as triumphant as you would have liked having worked so hard to, to make this happen? This is off the record, right? You're a journalist? Sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I can't speak on behalf. I'm no longer in a press role, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> I love journalists, but um, that ship has sailed. So, um, you know, that's an interesting question. And that's something that we got critiqued on the entire time, you know, that's something that Matheson really tried to say, you know, when she was at the convention, um, he was saying, well, I'm here in Utah with my people, you know, supporting. But I think that um, what we thought is anything to raise, you know, if, if she won and she went to Washington, she would automatically raise Utah's profile. So I think, to, you know, every, everybody can critique that and say that, especially post-campaign. Um, but I think that um, her whole thing was, I'm going to vote to help Utah. I'm going to go there and, and raise Utah's voice. Like, nobody, I'm sorry, but nobody in the country, I've worked on the Hill, nobody knew Jim Matheson, you know? So she would able, be able to give Utah a voice that was very unique. So whether or not you can say, you know, she should have been doing this or should have been doing that, you know, my job was fundraising, and so we loved it when she would go on national television because her online fundraising would skyrocket. Um, but... I think when it comes down to it, we must have mis or we must have underestimated Matheson's roots here in Utah because he definitely um, was able to galvanize his base. And so um, I don't know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I think that we would have said she's helping Utah in in this way. Me personally or Mia? I think she's still on the floor. No, I'm just kidding. She's doing great. Uh, me? Um, you know, yes, I, I don't have a job right now. I was telling Kelly. But, um, you know, I, um, I in fundraising, there's always money to be raised. There's always money to be had. So this was sort of the plan was to take a break and then reevaluate the fundraising opportunities I have ahead of me. So there's, there's always money. Campaigns, grassroots comes around every two, six years. But fundraising is actually pretty consistent. So we'll see. <clears throat> so I guess my question is two parts. The first is, how did you like living on the East Coast? And the second is, if you don't want to live on the East Coast but want to be involved in um, like some kind of excellent campaigning career, is that possible? Absolutely. Um, well, I loved the East Coast. It's it's a great environment, a very stimulating environment. Um, DC, there's just there's just nothing like it. People um, people are so interesting it was just you got to meet interesting people but I had a lot of friends especially um, through the LDS community that kind of wanted to move back west and were trying to figure out how they were gonna do that because um, it was kind of a jump um, or an uprooting um, and a lot of times people that have only worked in DC don't see outside of DC but there's always opportunities and there's always opportunities for campaigns I mean all campaigns really are is at a grassroots level. So there's absolutely opportunities um, across the nation to help out with those things. And um, and I was talking to somebody, and I mean, when Democrats are in power, or Republicans are in power, the other one just hangs out in kind of these policy think tanks in D.C. anyway. You know, there's, there's so much movement, especially in politics, that there's absolutely room across the country. Yeah. Anybody else? Hi, my name's Thomas Cook. Um, I just was curious, so at the on November 6th, because you did fundraising, does is it break even, there's nothing in the bank, in Mia Love's campaign, at, or is it, does stuff get left over? That's a really good question. Um, so I've, I've, um, I have a colleague that's been in, she's our, she was a consultant, the finance consultant, and she's been in this business for over 20 years. She was telling me some crazy stories. So. Really, when it comes down to it, a lot of people just 
don't prioritize fundraising, and that's a really big problem, and they end up taking out second mortgages on their house and taking out loans. And when it comes down to it, the person responsible for all that debt is the person running, is the candidate. So uh, she said she's seen, and then, and then staffers have even, if they don't get paid, they can sue that person individually as a person. And so you can get yourself in a world of hurt um, if you don't manage that correctly. Um, so Mia, we, we did very well in fundraising and we had some left over in the bank, but there's been post expenses, reimbursements, um, different things that I'm not sure where it's evening out now, but I don't, I don't uh, imagine we'll go into debt, but, um, um, and then the, the other interesting thing is like other candidates and stuff, when they raise a whole bunch of money and then they leave office or something, they're very limited on what they can do with that money. And so we still have like, um, I can't remember his last name, but Sheldon, he's a member, a Utah representative. He has like all this money that he gets. He's not, a, he's not, he, there, I think it was a scandal or something, but he now has all this money that he can't even touch. So he, he wrote us a check because he, can't do anything with this money, so it just sits there. So there's former members of Congress that we got checks from. I was like, I didn't, they're not a member anymore, but they have all this money left over that they are really tied on what they can do with it. So, yeah. Anybody else? I'm just curious how you got your job out of uh, college when you graduated. You said it's who you know. Um, I'm just mm -hmm. curious how you got that first job. So I, um, that's a good question. I um, interned with Edelman Public Relations. I had a friend who had interned there. That was in DC. And that's kind of, I wanted to do that because that was my major PR. But when I got there, I realized, I loved it. It was great, but I realized that if I was going to be living in DC, I wanted to do something that felt like I could only be in DC doing this job. And I really wanted to go back on the Hill. And truthfully, it was completely serendipitous, but I was talking to, um, I saw my roommate on the bus on the way home from work. She introduced me to another guy um, who was in our ward, who was also on the bus. And I told him I was looking for a job on the Hill. My internship at Edelman was ending. And the next day, he got an internal email. He was Senator Hatch's deputy press secretary. And he got an internal email from Senator Voinovich's press comms person saying, we're looking for this person. And he put two and two together, said, Stephanie was looking for a job in press. And she's from Ohio. And he emailed me. And the job never got even put you know, anywhere public. It was all internal. But it was from somebody in my ward, and that's how I got somebody in my ward from that job, somebody in my ward from Congressman Calvert, and then actually my current position helped me get into Congressman Austria's office. So my question comes from like why you decided to go into PR and like did you see yourself like I want to be on the hill so this is my path to get there. I yeah. mean, where does your vision come from and how did you I do that? I don't think I had a vision. Um, I was having too much fun in college. You guys are probably way more serious than communication students are. Um, I was, I love writing and I felt like really writing was the only thing I was good at or the best thing that I was good at. So I didn't even know what public relations was until I was well into the major, I'll tell you that too. Um, but I just decided to do communications because, and, and like I said, um, really watching the seminar was what sparked my interest in where I could foresee a career for myself. I don't know what I would have done if I wouldn't have done that. I don't know if I would have put DC in the cards because um, I didn't know that there were communications jobs on the Hill, but there's really communications jobs anywhere you can parlay that into a lot of different activities or into different careers. So um, really that's why I love watching the seminar program so much is because it opened my eyes. And maybe you can do that if you do an internship in New York. You know, there's so many different things. You just have to find them and, and be exposed to those opportunities. Oops. Anybody else? 